Hello and welcome to Hot and Heavy, the Elaine Bennis podcast. I'm your host, Shivani Desai. Today, I'm going to be talking about Season 2, Episode 1, The Ex-Girlfriend. Hello, everyone. Hope everyone's doing well. I'm doing okay. It's late. It's about 10 p.m. here in Colorado. (laughs) And I'm recording because my house is finally quiet. Uh, Not sure how many of you saw the Instagram post, but I took a little video of the level of noise in my house right now. Uh, We are having some construction done in our basement, so it's super exciting, but it's also very loud, which we were prepared for. So it's not a big deal, but uh, definitely cannot do any recording while that's going on. I had no choice. I did have to self-tape some auditions that came through uh, three this week, in fact, um, And I just kind of had to send him in and say, sorry about the banging in the background, but I really can't escape it right now. (laughs) But um, good thing I have I have a lavalier mic. So I have one of those mics that I can just clip on. um, And it really, even though you can kind of hear the background, it doesn't drown out my voice. So that's actually really good. I'm glad I invested in that. Um, Little did I know that it would come in handy mostly when I had walls being knocked down in my house, but uh, it's proven to be invaluable for uh, my (laughs) self-tapes. Other than that, my mom is going to be leaving soon. Kind of bummed. We're winding down her visit and trying to figure out some fun things to do. Now that the kids are out of school and my mom is still here for a few days. We are thinking about some fun things to do in Colorado with her before she leaves. I think we've landed on the zoo. There's a zoo here that's in the mountains. It's called the Cheyenne Mountain Zoo in Colorado Springs. It's incredibly beautiful. Not looking forward to saying goodbye to her next week, but that's how it goes. She's been with us for two months and We feel so lucky. She was fully vaccinated, and so we felt good about her traveling here. It's been awesome. All right, so let's get into the episode. I'm so excited to start season two. Ah, Season one was what it was, you know, it it was the introduction in so many ways. We were being introduced as an audience to this new kind of show. Jerry Seinfeld and Larry David were introducing themselves, I think, to sitcom writing and figuring out how to put this together. So like I said in a few episodes, I'm really forgiving of some of the things that can be easily criticized because of what we know the show becomes. But for me, I am appreciating where it started and to and where it where it ends up going. So that evolution is so interesting to, to watch and to discuss. Okay, so uh, kicking off season two is The Ex-Girlfriend, and my coffee table book has the following synopsis. George can't shed his annoying girlfriend Marlene until he takes Jerry's advice to break up like a band-aid. One motion, right off! Jerry begins seeing Marlene, but George is more annoyed that Jerry went behind his back to pay the balance of a bogus chiropractor bill. Marlene breaks up with Jerry because she doesn't like his comedy act. Elaine struggles to decide whether to confront an acquaintance in her building who recently stopped exchanging pleasantries, while Kramer persuades Jerry to buy fruit from Joe's fruit stand. This episode is written by Larry and Jerry. Already, this second season is off to a really strong start. The pacing is much better, and the cast seems very comfortable with each other. Season one, it seemed very obvious to me as a viewer that it was a little bit stilted. They were new to each other. And so the the chemistry was a little bit stilted and just not um, very comfortable or easy. But I feel like right off the bat in this episode, you can just feel the camaraderie. And in fact, Julie Louis-Dreyfus says something similar in a 1991 interview. This is what she said, quote, I just love it. It's never a drag to go to work. I hope it never is. I don't think it will be. We really enjoy one another's company, and that is reflected on screen. At least I think it is. We even have fun in rehearsals. It's a riot, end quote. Yeah, I mean, it feels more comfortable. It just, 
for lack of a better term, everything just seems more lived in. And essentially, just it feels more Seinfeld. The first scene is in Jerry's car. George and Jerry are discussing George's dilemma with how he really wants to break up with this girlfriend of his. You know, it wasn't his fault that they started dating. He had nothing to do with it. I mean, she, it was all her. <sighs> okay, George, you're such a victim. Sure. After a few minutes of them going back and forth about George's problem, Elaine arrives and she insists to sit in the front seat so she won't be left out of the conversation. And she calls George out on his homophobia because he doesn't want to sit boy, boy, girl in this bench seat. I'm like, what kind of car is Jerry driving that he's got a bench seat? I mean, it's the early 90s. And I think bench seats. OK, I have no car knowledge, so I'm not going to try and um assume or make any kind of statistics up. But it was just it was like, what? Why does he have a bench seat? Because we all know Jerry loves his sob in later episodes. But I do love the little, you're a little homophobic, aren't you? And, he, and George says, is it that obvious? I mean, he owns up to it. And uh, this really isn't something that would be said with much ease in uh, today's world. But um, you know, I get the sense with George's homophobia, it's it's definitely played as not like some kind of sycophantic, oh, let's put kids in conversion therapy or ban gay marriage. It's it's really about George's own insecurity with his masculinity. And I think Jason Alexander plays it that way really well. And I'm not condoning homophobia in any form at all. Let me just please make that clear. <laughs> but with George, I can't I can't see this being anything beyond his own issues versus what he thinks society should be doing with gay people or with uh, homosexuality or anything like that. And it's an ongoing theme with George. And uh, homophobia wasn't seen as taboo at that time to be this kind of casual homophobe who is more concerned about, oh my gosh, I don't want people to think I'm gay. It's fine. Not that there's anything wrong with that. I don't want to jump ahead, but we all know what's coming. To me, it's it's one of these things with George, and it just stems from his own uh, deep, deep insecurity, as we see many facets of George's insecurity throughout the entire series. As they start driving, Elaine tells the story, which is basically her, her whole storyline for the episode, about uh, an acquaintance in her building who she met, and they went from casual chatting with pleasantries to nothing. He went from nods to nothing. I love that George saying nods to nothing because it's relatable. It's that tick I was talking about last week where I just I'll hear something and things just kind of pop into my head. I wanted to go back to something one of our contributors said. Sarah Constantakis, she talked about in reference to the last episode where Elaine was dating Robert, who had the cats and she was allergic. Sarah talked about how this was in the beginning, something that always happened, her faceless suitors, as she talked about. And while this isn't a suitor per se, this is a another example of Elaine's plot of the episode involving a situation that that we don't see ever. And JLD's performance is fantastic at telling the story. I talked about before how it's not easy to tell a story versus showing the story. But when you're just relaying it, you really have to make it interesting. And her performance has so much energy behind it. And, and keep in mind, she's sitting in a car between Jerry and George on a bench seat. She doesn't have a lot of space to play with, physical space I'm talking about. But the energy comes from her voice inflection and her facial expressions. She does so much with such little room to move. And again, that's just that that magic that she brings, you know, give her anything and she can she can elevate it. And that's what I always say about Julie Louis-Dreyfus. And this is a great example of that. She's sitting in a tight space, yet we feel everything she's feeling in that story. And I like that George says to her, he's really invested. He says, absolutely have to confront him. The response, and this just feels, this is like that, ooh, that Steinfeld flavor I was talking about, a big dash of it when she says, oh, would you do that? And he's like, if I were a different person. Brilliant. Love that. That was such a great button at the end of that scene. So the purpose of the scene is the setup, as most first scenes are. Uh, George is unhappy in his relationship. Elaine has this weird animosity with the neighbor. 
Overall, it's a strong beginning. It feels so easy between Jerry and George before Elaine even gets there. I, I love their whole conversation. And I do like the the setup. It's nice to have this little d- different visual setup in the car. All right, the next scene is Jerry's apartment. I, I'm just going to mention something really quick here. Elaine doesn't uh, appear in this scene, um, but I do want to talk about Jason Alexander's performance telling the story about breaking up with Marlene. We learn her name in the scene. It's Marlene. It's just a perfect example of how to deliver a comedic monologue. One of my favorite parts of the entire series, I will say it, the entire series is when he's equating the breakup to a prison breakout and they shine that light on you and he kind of does that little stop and he's against the wall. Oh, it's so great. Oh, it's just so good. So I just wanted to mention that real quick. I love that in that scene. I, it, I'd be doing it a disservice if I didn't mention how brilliant Jason Alexander's performance is in that, in that scene and telling that story. Moving on to the next scene, that's when Jerry and Marlene are at Monk's. I love this character, Marlene. So just to talk a little bit about her, another female character in the episode. Uh, she's played by Tracy Colis or Collis. I'm not sure how you're supposed to say it. It's K-O-L-I-S. I'm going to say Colis. The governor of Colorado is Jared Polis, and it's spelled the same except with a P instead of a K. So I'm going with Colis, Tracy, and I apologize if it's not right. A little background on Tracy Colis. Um, she appeared quite a bit on television in the 80s and 90s, most notably All My Children and Quantum Leap. I loved Quantum Leap. That was a great show. She also reappears on Seinfeld as the waitress Kelly in the Soup episode. Now, she's the one who George tries to date, and she fakes having a boyfriend after George mentions he likes manure. So we'll look forward to seeing her again. I, I, I can definitely understand why they brought her back. She She's she's really strong. Uh, She actually retired from acting in 1999 and runs a small business with her husband selling cookies. I'm not sure how current that is, but uh, that's what it said on IMDb. I'm not digging much deeper than IMDb, folks. So she's great as Marlene. You know, she doesn't have a ton of scenes in this in this episode, but she's really effective as this sexy sort of Southern belle who clearly likes attention. She jumps in a pool with her clothes on and doesn't see what the big deal is. And uh, and then even as we learn with Jerry and George, respectively, she definitely needs a lot of their attention. I think she plays it really well. She is really sexy. She's really confident in the way she she's delivering her dialogue. I, I really liked her. I thought it was fantastic casting. Fantastic. Fantastic casting. Oh, God. It's late, you guys. Um, so the purpose of this scene is to introduce the dilemma with Jerry. He agrees to still be friends with Marlene, even though she and George have broken up. The overall take on the scene, yeah, I really liked it. Again, Tracy Collis is very good and really commands that that small role that she has. All right, moving on to the next scene. Uh, Elaine's not in this one either, but I wanted to include it because of how much they talk about Marlene. It's the chiropractor scene with George and Jerry in the waiting room. So Jerry is complaining about how annoying Marlene is, and George is supporting and, and completely agreeing with everything he's saying. I did love the, hello, Jerry. I don't know, sometimes it's, I liked this. It felt so natural. The writing is so good, how they're going back and forth. And it's so relatable. All the things they talk about, I feel like we've all experienced that person who's not a bad person, but just has no self-awareness and really doesn't have a second thought that anything they're doing is annoying the other person. Then George mentions to Jerry, she is sexy though. And he just agrees outright. I find this interesting. I'm not going to go into whole like the difference between men and women, blah, blah, blah. But I will say the difference between at least Jerry, George and myself is that if a guy was that annoying, they're talking so passionately about how annoying she is. (laughs) For me, if I was that annoyed with a guy, I couldn't find him sexy. It's that mental block that would block any kind of desire below the equator, if you know what I'm saying. To find someone sexy, it implies that you'd want to sleep with that person. And for me personally, I need to be like mentally into a guy as well as physically for that to happen. 
That was just so interesting to me. They can go on and on about everything that they find annoying about her, yet they're like, ooh, she's she's still so sexy. The purpose of this scene is to establish how Jerry cannot stand Marlene. And my overall take is it's it's very funny. Uh, love the back and forth again with George and Jerry about Marlene. Jerry is really animated in this scene, and I thought it looked very natural. I thought he did a great job acting wise. He was more animated than Jason Alexander in that exchange, which was a nice change. Usually it's George who's a little bit over the top, and Jerry's, you know, the one that's kind of the straight man. But uh, I liked with the, oh! You can't like he he really uh, kind of came out of his shell to express his disdain with with everything about Marlene. And I haven't mentioned anything about George's annoyance with the chiropractor. Um, oh, hello, doctor. I do. I just wanted to mention that because now having watched Curb Your Enthusiasm and seeing Larry David in all his Larry Davidness. Now looking back and watching George Costanza through that lens, this situation is just so Larry David. I mean, I can't now, it's so funny. It's now everything's so interconnected. When I watch George Costanza now, I'm like, oh my God, that's totally something Larry David would do. So this situation read very Larry <laughs> to me. And I I thought it was, it was really funny. Uh, the next scene is just coming back uh, to the chiropractor. It's nothing really to talk about. George is mad about the bill, only pays half. Moving on to the scene where Jerry and Marlene kiss in Jerry's car. There was such a long pause between Marlene saying goodbye and kissing him on the cheek and then Jerry saying goodbye. A bit too long, I have to say. I, I really didn't understand the point of that. It was just, it was just kind of like, let's move this along. All right. The purpose of the scene, obviously, Jerry and Marlene have crossed a line. They've kissed a little bit. And overall, it's no real take on it. Just uh, needed to push that story forward. The next scene is in Jerry's apartment. Jerry is screening his calls because of Marlene. I love the the message she leaves about, have you ever taken a bath in the dark? Oh, I love it. It's just, it's that perfect, like, what the hell is, what is that? Why do you leave this message? So it, it was a nice little encapsulation and exa- a real time example of what she does and how bizarre it is. Uh, Jerry expresses to Kramer that he got a little physical with her, but she has this psychosexual hold on him. He just wants he just wants her. I love Kramer's laugh when Jerry says he feels awful. It's such a weird reaction that he gets this like pleasure from Jerry feeling this way. And he just is so open with it. He's like, I'm just going to laugh when Jerry's kind of struggling here. Just thought that was really funny. Elaine arrives and She's returning some airplane lamp to Jerry. It was very odd, but it was not explained and I didn't mind it, but it was just cute. She had this little airplane lamp that he wanted back. Elaine mentions that whole thing about how slow Jerry's elevator is and how that's hard to get used to because she's used to so many fast ones. And he makes his little comment, well, the apartment elevators don't have to be very fast because you never have to be home on time. Elaine's little, I guess you could call it a little joke where, well, what if you were married to a dictator kind of thing? Jerry's retort up to her comment is almost like, oh, he's humoring this poor lady who made a dumb joke. I don't know. It was a little condescending. And it just annoys the comedian in me because why does why does she have to make the dumb jokes and men just have to tolerate it? I don't know. I, I might be getting a little oversensitive here, but I didn't like how she didn't get that joke in the robbery about the thief returning Jerry's messages. And then now she's got some dumb comment about being married to a dictator. It just feels a little condescending to the Elaine character. And as we've talked about before, it's just this whole period of time where they're not really sure what to do with her and, and they're not giving her a lot of really good material yet. Anyway, I just thought that little moment was annoying. All right, so she tells Jerry about her confrontation with a guy in her building. Just like Jason and Alexander delivered a brilliant comedic monologue telling the breakup story with Marlene, this is a great example of JLD doing the same thing, telling the story of confronting this neighbor. Everything from the way she's standing to the changes in her voice as she's reenacting it, to that big old chomp of cantaloupe at the end is perfect. As I mentioned before, one of JLD's biggest strengths is her physicality. And I don't mean 
physical comedy in the sense of like Jack Tripper from Three's Company. Many of you probably won't know who that is. But what I mean, it's not like, oh, just falling down and doing clumsy kind of comedy with her body, which we all know she is absolutely capable of and is brilliant at that as well. What she shows in this monologue is just a confidence in her own body. And that's that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about her physicality. And she just knows exactly how to move it and shift it during her dialogue, like little things here and there. Sometimes it's big, sometimes it's very subtle, but she's acting with her whole body. And I, and I love that. And as a young girl watching her, I always noticed what she did physically. Everything from like a little flick of the hand to a twitch of her nose. This is what elevates her above so many others, in my opinion. The purpose of this scene, well, all this cantaloupe stuff with Kramer and Jerry, and uh, Elaine inspires Jerry to confront George about the kiss with Marlene. My overall take is it's fun, and Elaine really, really shines. It's her last scene in the episode, and I love that she ends it with the line, this cantaloupe stuff. Thanks. Because she's just had this grandiose kind of story that she told and she's so kind of proud of herself. And then it's just this reversal of mood with the cantaloupe just being terrible. All right. The next scene, uh, Jerry confesses to George. He doesn't really care. So we'll just move on to the final scene with Marlene and Jerry in the car. She's turned off. It's not going to happen. Jerry is all about getting further physically with her. But uh, bottom line, she saw his act. So kind of continuing my thought process about having to be attracted mentally to a guy as well as physically, I I see what Marlene means here. While it, it might not be as specific as like, I can't be with someone if I don't respect what they do, I definitely understand if I see someone doing something or acting in a way that I fundamentally just can't relate to or enjoy, yeah, I'm just not going to be attracted to them anymore. So she's nipping it in the bud. I kind of respect that. Um, if she were to get more invested, she'd have to pretend like she likes Jerry's comedy, you know, and, and that would be kind of torturous, I think. After all, it wouldn't her kind of humor. Also, I do love how Jerry's material is always a punchline on the show. And they started this so early and just kept it going throughout. I mean, Jerry always needs new material. <laughs> they always kind of make comment on that. He's got nothing. And just to expand on this whole like, well, Jerry and George still want to have sex with her or wanted to, as in George's case, even though they find her repulsive sort of mentally and emotionally. George's comment, kind of going back to what he says, he doesn't want to get the books himself from her apartment because huh, it could be dangerous sexually. Like It's almost like he doesn't have control over, over himself. Like It's so fascinating to me. I mean, even though he pretty much can't stand anything about her, he knows he could be taken down by her with sex. Uh, it's just, it's such a foreign concept to me. So I just find it very interesting. And even though this is presented as a very gender specific preference on the show, I don't want to assign this to women feel this way versus men, because I have known plenty of women who do this. I've had friends who can't stand the guy they're dating's personality. I mean, they'll, they'll bitch about it to me and other friends, but they still are just so overly attracted sexually to him. And they continue to have sex with these people, even though they just spent half an hour saying how much they couldn't stand them as a person. And these same friends were baffled that I couldn't do what they were doing. But it just for me personally, I can't separate the two. It's I once oh my God, I just thought about this. I once had a crush on this guy in college and he just he worked at a bar that I would go to. Oftentimes he'd be taking IDs at the door. He was a bar back. I just had this huge crush on him. And then one night I got the courage up. He was, I think he was off his shift and he was just sta- sitting at the end of the bar and I got the courage up to talk to him. And holy shit, it was uh, like night and day attraction wise. He just didn't come off very, um, you know, I was going to say he came off very stupid and that sounds very harsh, but he he did. I have to be honest. I, I believe he said supposedly and especially in the same sentence, which done. Beyond that, he was just he was just very douchey and kind of came off immature, which I guess, OK, he's 21. Right. But my whole point is that he just he didn't even look attractive to me from that moment forward. I would still see him quite often. And it was almost a relief, to be quite honest, because <laughs> I just had this crush and I'd get nervous. Oh, my gosh, he's so cute. And then right after that, I was like, all right, I can relax around this guy because I do not find him attractive anymore. So the purpose of this scene is Jerry couldn't close a deal because of his act. 
my overall take, I love this kind of twist at the end <laughs> that I, I just love that a show that's based on Jerry Seinfeld's comedy shows that it's his comedy that keeps him from getting laid. It, it's it's perfect. It's great. I love it. All right. So we're going to take a quick break and I'll see you on the other side. Oh, hello, dear. I saw you yesterday carrying all those bags down the street and thought, my goodness, they could really use a handy cart for those groceries. I'm Edith McGovern, owner of Rent Edith's Cart. For just a few dollars an hour, you can come on over and rent my cart if I'm not using it. Just make sure you return it as you found it. Clean as a whistle and not one bad wheel. Don't bother stealing your own cart when I have a perfectly good one you can rent. Stolen by yours truly over 40 years ago from the A&P in Topeka. Just head on over to the Knights of Columbus on Bellevue and find the sign-up sheet on the bulletin board to reserve your slot. For a limited time, you will receive a kerchief from my personal collection. Perfect to protect your hair after a visit to the beauty parlor. Rent Edith's Cart. That's the name and the slogan. And we're back. There weren't any DVD extras on this episode beyond the notes about nothing. And the most interesting note about nothing, I thought, was that Heidi Swedberg, who goes on to play Susan Ross in the series, she auditioned for the role of Marlene. And I just couldn't help but think, what if she got that role? Then we probably would have gotten a different actress to play Susan. But I suppose everything worked out as it was supposed to. All right, now moving on to Contributor Corner. I have a couple of comments this week. The first one is from contributor Greg. Greg lives in New York City. His Seinfeld story, he watched it as it originally aired with his parents and watched reruns through when the DVDs became available and then watched those. Now he continues to stream it whenever he needs a good laugh. This is what Greg said about his three favorite things about Elaine Bennis. I like how she went from arguably the least successful to the most successful of the group. I like how strong she was, not intimidated, and still able to stand up for what she thought was right. I like how she would bully George, almost hating him, but would still have his back on things. I do too. That was such a good point about her relationship with George. This is what Greg sent in an email about the ex-girlfriend. It irks me that Elaine asks to sit in the front of the car between Jerry and George so that she can be involved in the conversation. How far are they driving in New York City that some full-blown deep conversation beyond where are we going and where are we parking would occur? This is me being picky, but it shows to her more childish side in the early years of the show. She later becomes a full-on boss, and not only would she demand to be in the front seat, she would shame George into moving into the back seat himself. Greg goes on to say, the conversation about the guy Elaine no longer gets hellos from is the brilliance of this show in a nutshell. Everyday social behavior that we can relate to. I also love here how it's George who gives her advice on how to confront the guy. If it's one thing that George can teach Elaine, it's how to be vindictive or petty. The relationship is my favorite amongst the four. She hates him. He's constantly bitter towards her. And yet because of a mutual friend who neither is willing to spend less time with, they are forced into friendship and she later takes his advice, which I like. Yeah, I, I mean, I mentioned it too when um, we were talking about that scene. I do love that it's George who gives her that advice. And uh, I really, d I've never thought about my favorite relationship in the show, but I can definitely see what Greg is saying here about George and Elaine. It is, it is such an interesting relationship, a forced friendship, but it seems almost brother and sister to me a little bit. Great observation, Greg. Another thing Greg mentions is Jerry talking to George's ex-girlfriend just shows me that he hates having conversations with any woman that isn't Elaine. He's completely himself with her and he's not like that with any other woman, but yet them as a couple could never work. I have a female friend like this, so I can totally relate to that dynamic. It kind of goes back to the conversation that Jerry has with his parents in the stakeout where they kind of they don't get it. They're like, you like being with her. You like talking to her. You, you're friends. Why, why can't you go beyond that? 
But those are just how some relationships are. So I really did like that commentary, Greg. Greg goes on to say there are glimpses of Elaine's future badassness in her recanting of the story of confronting her neighbor. She's always so proud of herself when she has the chutzpah to call someone out. The triumphant chomping into the cantaloupe is just such good physical comedy to cap off her story too. And then the immediate this is terrible brings her right back down from her high. Oh, totally, Greg. I loved, I did love that too. The victorious chomp and then she's got to spit it out. And then lastly, Greg says... Unrelated to Elaine, but why is Jerry in his car 50 times in this episode? Nobody drives here even when they own a car. I love that. Thank you, Greg, for that New Yorker commentary. I didn't even think about that, but I guess you would know if you live there. (laughs) And yeah, he is in his car quite a bit. So I don't know. He does have a show now called Comedians in Cars Getting Coffee. So I think maybe it was like in his contract, he needs to be in a car. And then we have Sheil, who sent in some more comments this week. Last week, we heard from Sheil, who is my brother. Uh, And this week, he sent in an email about the ex-girlfriend. This is what Sheil had to say. To confront or not to confront seems to be what the cast was struggling with in this episode. We find Jerry counseling George to just break up with his girlfriend in person instead of by phone. Elaine doesn't know what's going on with the guy in the lobby who won't nod at her anymore. So George counsels her to talk to him to find out what's the deal with the no more nodding. When George is not happy with his visit to the chiropractor, sorry, doctor, he doesn't want to pay the entire bill. Jerry thinks that's rude, but George wants the chiropractor to know he was not happy. Jerry does not want to buy fruit from Joe's, so Kramer tells him he has to return bad fruit, a confrontation of sorts. And when Marlene breaks up with Jerry because she can't be with someone if she doesn't respect what they do. The only one who can't seem to do the confronting is Jerry. All in all, the ex-girlfriend was a pretty strong showing for the first episode of the new season. You can see some of the groundwork being laid for future episodes. For example, Elaine remarks how George is being homophobic because he won't sit next to Jerry in the car, a trait which will be significant in the outing. Joe's fruit shop will also be brought back in the episode The Mango, where Kramer is banned for confronting Joe about the spoiled peach he had at Jerry's. Also, we see Kramer's love of golf well before his infamous hole-in-one. Shield continues, This was a very weak Elaine episode. I actually looked at the timestamps of when she was on screen. JLD was in a scene in the car for 1 minute 48 seconds, and then again 12 minutes later for an even 2 minutes. That's 3 minutes and 48 seconds out of a 23-minute show. That's like if Phil Jackson was like, Michael Jordan, I'm only going to play you for 8 minutes in this game. Crazy, right? Is JLD the MJ of Seinfeld? Debatable, but you get my point. JLD crushes it in her second scene when she recaps to Jerry her confrontation with the lobby guy. Very funny stuff. And we see some classically brilliant Elaine eating and talking shtick. But again, it's more of Elaine has an issue with a guy we never see. And Sheil ends off his thoughts with, I'd like to think that I enjoyed the episode for what it was back when I first watched it. My impression of the ex-girlfriend upon this rewatch is certainly colored by my knowledge of the development of the characters and insanely hilarious episodes to come. So it's hard to be objective when you know what the show is capable of. Whoa, leave it to Sheil to again find the sort of central theme of the episode, confrontation. To confront or not to confront, as Sheil says. <laughs> I didn't even think about it. Again, that's what my brother does. I really think that was an interesting way to look at it. So many confrontations that they did or did not want to have in the entire episode. And completely agree with, it is hard to to see these early episodes and not think ahead of all the brilliance that's in the future for us. But like I said before, seeing this evolution definitely makes me appreciate how far the show grows to what we uh, what we see pretty soon here. I mean, this I agree with Sheila. It's a, it's a strong showing and uh, really feels more Seinfeld for sure. So those were our comments for Contributor Corner. If you would like to become a contributor, please email me at elainepodcast at gmail.com. E-L, oh my God, it's so late for me. I don't think I can spell. E-L-A-I-N-E-P-O-D-C-A-S-T at (laughs) gmail.com. Email me and you could become a contributor and maybe hear your thoughts on the show. 
My favorite Elaine moment definitely was the biting into that cantaloupe. It, it just, it's such a little thing, but it's such a great cap to that fantastic comedic monologue that she, uh, that she delivers about her confrontation. In final notes, there's definitely more substance to Elaine's portion, but she's still in this underutilized period of the show. I mean, that's clear. Her plot was all about something that's happening that we never see. And she's totally shut out of all the other stories. Well, except the cantaloupe stuff, but... um, With the whole Jerry, George, and Marlene, she has absolutely no involvement. She doesn't even know any of that's going on, which I found a little bit odd that we know is going to change soon with what I talked about last week with this whole dovetailing of all the storylines that Larry David becomes a big advocate of. He sort of wants to structure all the shows that way, like, hey, let's make everything kind of converge at the end so that every storyline touches each other. But yeah, this one, it was like, wow, (laughs) Elaine's story, they could have picked up that story and put it in any other episode because it really had nothing to do with the A story, which was obviously Jerry, George, and Marlene, little love triangle. The only thing I can think of is just budget. I mean, I don't think they had the budget to cast these men that so far Elaine's talking about. In these early episodes, the A stories really lie with Jerry and George. And you can understand why. I mean, Jerry and Larry were writing themselves through Jerry and George, and we're still figuring out how to get Elaine and Kramer, for that matter, in there. I mean, Kramer's stories aren't very substantive either. I mean, they're pretty flimsy. Uh, dare I say, even flimsier than than uh, Elaine's. Overall, I do think this was a strong start. Even with the imbalance of involvement from Elaine and Kramer, um, the pacing and the chemistry of all the characters feels so much better. And it was just a lot more fun to watch. And that's all I can say about The Ex-Girlfriend. Thank you so much for listening. I'm going to have to keep recording at night and I hopefully I think I'll just have to have some caffeine before this. Sorry if I sound a little tired and groggy voice. Uh, I'll I'll uh yeah, maybe oh, you know what? Maybe some Viverin. I took that in college. And no, it didn't do anything. Uh so <laughs> but I'll figure it out. Uh thank you again for listening and I will see you next time.